Good afternoon, Tom. Thank you for being here again today. You recently did an update on the Schrodinger's cat experiment that is mm -hmm. part of your MBT science trilogy. There was a comment about that update that asked, would this invalidate the concept that is in the original Schrodinger's cat experiment? Well, now, let me explain a little bit about the Schrodinger's cat experiment. For one, it's a Gedanken experiment, and that's a German term, which means thought experiment. It's an experiment that was never done. Nobody would ever do it. Nobody's going to put a lot of cats in boxes with poison and things. That's uh, not an experiment that would ever be done. Erwin Schrodinger was the physicist that came up with this. And Erwin Schrodinger was also the person that came up with the wave equation. Okay, so that wave equation was interpreted to be such that things exist in a superposition of multiple states until the measurement is made and then one of those states is picked. That is the way physicists interpreted Schrodinger's wave equation. Schrodinger looked at that and he says, yeah, but that's silly. Listen, if you had a bunch of cats in these pens and, and he went on to do this thing, he says, you'd have to say that the cat was both dead and alive in a superimposed state of being both dead and alive. And then when the measurement was made, you'd get one of those two states, one answer or the other. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, Schrodinger said that kind of tongue in cheek, because it is bizarre to think of a cat being both dead and alive at the same time. And that's what your quantum physics says. That's how it works. Well, it doesn't work like that. Schrodinger wasn't really complaining or not complaining about it. He just was saying it sure does give a silly result if you think about it in terms of a living thing being both dead and alive. So anyway, so I did a little experiment in Excel where I set up how quantum physics really works. And the way it works isn't that the cat is both dead and alive in some superimposed states, both states at the same time. That isn't true. That is a misunderstanding that scientists had when they tried to interpret Schrodinger's equations. They look at the math and say, well, what's really going on here? And from looking at the math, they said, well, it looks like there's a superposition of states and all of the states are probable and one of them gets selected. Well, if all the states are probable before the selection takes place, before the measurement is made, then it must exist in both states simultaneously. Well, that's just a wrong interpretation. It's not like that at all. So I did this little thing on, in Schrodinger's equation, uh, in Schrodinger's um, experiment in Excel. And the way that quantum mechanics really works isn't that things are suspended in multiple states. It's that when a measurement is made, the system rendering this virtual reality takes a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. Okay, so there's all the possibilities that could happen, and each possibility has a probability. And you put those probabilities in a distribution, and then you take a random draw from that distribution. Now, what that means is the things that are most likely, you know, have the highest probabilities, well, they're the ones that are most likely to come out of that random draw. The things that are very, very unlikely have a very small chance of coming out at that random draw. And if you, if that language bothers you, then please go look at any number of my uh, workshops, starting with the one that I gave in Huntsville, and it'll explain that distribution and how that works. And you can find a whole, you know, 15 minutes devoted just to explaining the details of that. I don't want to do that here. But in any case, it's, it's there if, if that confuses you, what the random draw means. So that's what's going on. It is a virtual reality. And when the measurement is made, that means somebody takes a measurement and the rendering engine 
has to deliver something as a result of that measurement, right? So you open a door that has a cat in a pen, or you open the door of your refrigerator and look inside, or, you know, you measure the speed of light or whatever it is you do. When you make a measurement and there's something new, some new information you're going to get on this measurement, the system has to know what to render. And if it could be in one of five or 10 different states, let's say there's five or 10 different possibilities, could be in any of those, okay? But some are more probable than others. What the system renders is that random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. Okay, so I showed that in Excel. I did that calculation. I took random draws from probability distributions of the possibilities for each time given each second or each minute that passed, those probabilities constantly are changing. So the possibilities stay the same. Cat's dead, cat's alive, only two, it's binary. But the probabilities of being dead or alive are a function of time. Okay, the longer that, that, the, that radioactive uh, source spits off particles, then the more likely it is that sooner or later, one of them is going to hit that Geiger counter and kill the cat. You see, so as time goes by, probabilities are changing. And when you make a measurement, then you get a result based on that random draw. Okay, so that's the Schrodinger's cat story. It's not a real experiment. It's a Gedanken. Gedanken, Duncan in German is thought, thinking. So it's a, a thought experiment. And it was a tongue-in-cheek assertion by Schrodinger just to show the silliness of the result. And indeed, it is silly. The thing that's even sillier is that the physicist looked at it and says, yep, that's the way it works. The cat's both dead and alive at the same time. Sure enough. And of course, that's just not true. So they are, they've, they've looked at the math. The math works, but their interpretation of the math was just wrong because it's a virtual reality. Virtual realities ex exist only in the minds of the players. And when some new information is, has to be delivered to a player, then it is delivered at that time the player makes that measurement for that new information, and it delivers it by a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. So cats aren't both dead and alive. You know, and, if we didn't have a cat, had he made it less funny and less amusing and just said there was a, there was a balloon in there full of paint. And when the particle hits the Geiger counter, it would pop the balloon and the balloon would splatter paint all over the inside of the, of the cage. Okay, now we don't have a cat, but the experiment works the same way. And the physicists would say, well, the cage is both splattered with paint and not splattered with paint at the same time. And when we make the measurement, we get one of those. See, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. The cat is irrelevant. The cat was just there because it was funny, you know, of a cat being both dead and alive at the same time. So that's the point. It's not really about the cat. So the experiment that I did in Excel is exactly correct. Although in, when I did that experiment, the language I used wasn't exactly precise. It would have been exactly precise had it been a ball of paint or a balloon full of paint, then my language would have been perfect because I think of it that way because the cat's really irrelevant to the outcome of the experiment. That's not the point. But then it was pointed out that if it really was a cat and not a ball of paint, then the cat would actually die when that uh, particle hits the Geiger counter and the poison's release, released, the cat dies. And then after that point, when the door is opened, they'll find a dead cat, okay? Once the door's opened. So it doesn't have to die instantly as the door's open. And that's what my language kind of implied, that the cat would be in no state at all, would be in an undefined state till the door was opened. But that is the case for the balloon and the paint, but it's not the case for the cat because the cat is also getting a data stream. And it's getting that data stream updated, I don't know, you know, let's say, uh, you know, 100 times a second. It's being updated, but they're not checking the door at 100 times a second. 
they just check the door whenever, maybe once a minute or something, you see. So the cat may have died and been dead for some time before the measurement was made and find a dead cat. So the body could have been warm or could have been cold. And that was the a little difference in language if you really have a cat. But it doesn't change the Gadonkin experiment. It's exactly the same. Also, a point I should make here, Donna, is that the cat is conscious. The cat and the cat's consciousness is the very first awareness of the cat dying. You know, the last thing that cat hears is which is the sound of poison gas leaking into its chamber. So it's aware of that, then it's aware of the fact that it's getting sick and drowsy and aware that it's dying and the cat dies. So it is really the cat's consciousness that makes that measurement first, because the cat is the awareness that's aware of the cat being alive or not alive, uh, not the human. So that fact is something that was overlooked and created a bit of problem for, for physicists in the sense that the idea that the cat would be dead before the experimenter made the measurement was pointed out by physicists decades later when they were very interested in, in uh, getting away from the idea that consciousness had anything to do with the result of quantum physics. And that is that obviously consciousness wasn't involved because the cat was already dead before the human opened the door to look and make the measurement and see whether the cat was alive or dead. So it wasn't the human that was creating that measurement and finding that result. The result already had happened before. Therefore, this idea that consciousness uh, you know, was, was the thing that had to create the measurement is, uh, was wrong. Well, <laughs> that's because they were thinking that the cat is not conscious. Only humans are conscious. Cats are not conscious. And the fact is that cat made that measurement first. That's when it was decided, when that cat uh, realized that it was being poisoned or heard the, the hiss of the gas or whatever, and then uh, began to die. That's when the cat became aware, you know, that uh, <laughs> something was wrong. And uh, perhaps uh, it wasn't aware that it was dying, but it, it was aware of what was going on in its cage at that time. That something was changing. So that is the consciousness that got the data stream that was the measurement, that cat's awareness made the measurement that the cat was getting the poison gas. So it's a mistake to think that humans are the only consciousness that counts or that humans are the only conscious being, that other animals are not conscious. Uh, if you are interested in that subject, or if my, our listeners are interested in that subject, they can go to my YouTube channel and go to the, uh, the place where they can search for topics. And I do talk about animal consciousness. And consciousness is consciousness. And if, uh, you know, we talk about the man who walks into the woods and the, when he opens his eyes and looks at the woods, then some, that woods is created for him by the larger conscious system. If it's a woods that has never been seen before, then it's created completely, you know, out of probability for him. But if there's a squirrel living in a tree right next to the little pond, before he gets to that woods, then that woods is already created for the squirrel. But now the woods that's created for the squirrel is not necessarily the same as the woods created for the human because a squirrel consciousness sees certain things and misses certain things. And same with the human consciousness. So each wouldn't get necessarily the same data stream about the woods. They'd get a data stream that was specific to their perspective and, and their ability and the uh, experience that each had. So that may bring up the subject of whether 
A cat looking at the results of a double slit experiment would be enough to make the uh, uh, wave function cohere into a particle pattern. Okay, because now consciousness knows, you see. So once the consciousness knows, then we, we get the particle pattern. Consciousness makes the measurement. But that, of course, isn't going to happen because the cat doesn't know anything about, <laughs> you know, the physics experiment. So in that case, it would be the human consciousness that would be key, not a cat consciousness. So it's not just any consciousness at any time doing anything. The whole point of this idea is that the larger consciousness system is trying to create a virtual reality that doesn't look like it's a virtual reality. No, it needs to be consistent, all the time consistent. So if there's an inconsistency for humans, if sometimes light's a particle and sometimes light's a wave, and it seems like, you know, there's a, there's a flat inconsistency there. Why should it be when uh, photons who do not interact with each other come one at a time, why should they just distribute themselves into this pattern? That's an interference pattern. There's nothing to interfere. Single photons, one at a time. They don't interfere with themselves or any other such nonsense you hear physicists say. So why should they end up in an interference pattern? Because ending up in that interference pattern is what creates a consistency between optics and quantum physics. Otherwise, there'd be no bridge there. There'd be a, a discontinuity, a logical a break if that didn't happen. That's why that had to happen. That's why that result in quantum physics had to take place that way. So it's all about whether a conflict will be created. Now, if a cat was looking at the data coming out of this double slit experiment, it wouldn't find a conflict in the data, <laughs> no matter what the data showed, because the cat isn't aware of the data. The cat only sees things and is aware of things that cats would see and be aware of. So there is no conflict with a cat. So the system really wouldn't care one way or another. Uh, if a human looks at that and says, oh, why is there an interference pattern when we have one particle? Hmm. Well, it has to do that so that it's consistent with the wave theory that has thousands, hundreds of thousands of particles going through the slits and interfering with each other and creating an interference pattern. Because we know that those particles don't interact. It's not like because there's so many particles, they bump into each other and by accident create a wave function. No, that doesn't happen. So that's why uh, the quantum physics gets that particular result that breaks materialism. Materialism uh, cannot get to that result, that the particles coming through the double slits one at a time should land on the screen in an interference pattern, you see. But the system had to do that so it would avoid a logical inconsistency. So no, cats looking at a double slit experiment wouldn't change anything. The system would not feel like that was a, that was a problem. Humans looking at it, ah, that's a problem. So when the cat first noticed that the gas was hissing and it was you know, in the process of dying, that's the measurement that first came to the conclusion that the cat was going to die. That separates the live cat from the dead cat, that particular awareness of the cat. So in that case, the cat makes the measurement and ends up a dead cat when he hears that hiss when he makes the measurement. Like, ah, do I hear a hiss? That's a measurement. Nope, don't hear one. Well, do I hear a hiss now? Oh, there it is. That's the measurement that indicates a dead cat. So that's how this works whether the, the, the inside of the cat cage is 
splattered with red paint or not splattered with red paint. And the fact that it's either one or the other, and they're both, it's both splattered with red paint and not splattered with red paint at the same time until the measurement's made. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not both at the same time. One is picked to be rendered according to the probability when the random draw is made. So that's, that's what's going on there. So that person has said, well, then the thing you did was wrong. No, it wasn't wrong. I gave the right answer for the right reasons, but I did make a mistake in saying that when the door was open and you look in there and see that cat, that's exactly when the cat was either rendered dead or alive. But that's not the case. The cat may have been rendered dead earlier in cat time because the cat was getting lots of updates in its environment of inside that thing, whereas the experimenters were not updating that, that quickly. Experimenters were only opening doors, you know, every so often. So that's the difference. It's the exact same experiment. No errors were done other than a, a very minor one. And I made that error because, in my mind, cat, red paint, anything, you know, just doesn't, it doesn't matter. The point is, whatever the two states would be, painted or not painted, it's not both. It's not both until the measurement's made or in, they're both in superposition. Nothing's in superposition. That's, that's not actually what's going on. That's just a misinterpretation of the, of the physics based on how physicists misinterpreted the, you know, the equations, the wave equations. So that's what that's about. So there's nothing really wrong there other than a minor uh, detail because the live cat could have died before the door was opened, could have, not, didn't have to die right at that moment. That's very interesting. And I hope that answers the question, uh, does that invalidate the experiment? Because in both cases, uh, no animal was hurt and no balloon exploded. <laughs> yes, okay. Indeed. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. Schrodinger's cat was not a real experiment, therefore did not scientifically prove anything. Of course. Not even part of any scientific theory. No, no, Simply actually. Simply a teaching tool that Schrodinger mm. used to illustrate how some people were misinterpreting quantum theory. Right, misinterpreting, right? Yeah, except that, that misinterpreting, they told Schrodinger to sit down and be quiet, that that is what they're <laughs> going to say. Because but they interpreted anyway. Yeah, he was trying to show how silly it was. And, oh my gosh. And but the this physicist swallowed the whole thing, you know, hook, line, and sinker, as they say. And they <laughs> say, absolutely, the cat exists both, you know, in, in a superposition of states, both dead and alive. And Schrodinger, who actually came up with that wave equation and the theory, said, That's ridiculous. Listen, what about two you know, what about cats in boxes? You know, is the cat dead and alive at the same time? And of course, he was, <laughs> he was just trying to be funny and make that point that that is not a good interpretation. Oh, my God. But it's the interpretation well, that physicists right now, you know, live and die by. Things don't exist in superpositions of states. That's what they say. And that is not the correct interpretation for quantum physics. And that's what Schrodinger was pointing out. It's not a superposition of multiple states. If there's you know, 10 different possibilities, there's not a superposition of 10 different things and the part and whatever is in, in all 10 of them. And then when you make a measurement, one of them coalesces into a live physical thing and the rest disappear. See, they're trying to make math into something physical, something real. So they have, they see the equation, they try to interpret the equation, they interpret it this way. And they would pretend that that is the way the world is. Now, in the beginning with Schrodinger making that, that funny, you know, that, that remark with Schrodinger's cat, those people knew that that wasn't the whole answer and that this was not a, the right, you know, not a good interpretation. Just like but they knew about no, Copenhagen. But, but nobody, nobody could come up with really anything better. So it more and more as the years went by, People believed that that was exactly the way it was. 
like they did with the devil slip. Yeah. Yeah. But why was it so convenient? Well, because if you don't have any other choices, then people don't like being uncertain. It's the uncertainty. They okay. don't like uncertainty. Okay. So they say, well, we don't have any other way to explain it, so it must be that way. Things exist in these, these uh, superimposed states until the measurement's made, and that's the way quantum physics works. Uh-huh. You know? So that is not that is not exactly right as far as what's physically going on. They're taking an equation that is mathematics and yeah. trying to turn it into something physical. And I know when I was in, mm. in doing physics, you know, way back in the very beginning, I don't know whether this was my physics 101 in college or what, mm. but I was told or I read that the interpretations of what's physically going on from looking at the mathematics, here's the mathematics, and then we interpret what that means physically. But those interpretations have nothing to do with reality. You know, and don't don't believe them. You know, and I was cautioned about that. And I don't know whether I just knew that intuitively or uh-huh. whether I read or whatever, but I had that very strongly impressed <laughs> upon me that mathematics is not the physical world. Yeah. Mathematics is a logical process. It's the it's the logic of quantity. And it says something. And that something is either logical or it's not. So the answer is, you know, true or, or wow. not. But to try to say what that means physically. Now, as long as the equations are very simple, it's pretty easy to say how they apply and what's going on physically from the equation. But as soon as the equations start to get probabilistic, then you just lose the connection with the physical world. Okay, it's not, they're not talking about a physical process anymore. They're talking about something else. So, and it's not just statistical, there's other things. Even if the equations are not statistical, when they get complex enough to say, well, physically, this is what's going on. Well, physicists do that just because it makes the subject easier to talk about. So they make up these things that they can say. But they have to keep in their mind that that thing is not really true. It's just what they're calling it because that's what it seems like. But what happens is then decades go by Mm -hmm. and they begin to think it's true. And pretty soon that thing that was just said so it would make it easier to talk about, that thing becomes fact in the minds of physicists. And that is the way the world works. And that is a physical thing now just because it's never change. Nobody's ever said, well, it's not like that, really. Here, look, it could be this other thing. So if nobody can find some other way to do it or other way to think about it, three decades go by and it becomes a fact when it's not a fact at all. It's just the, it's, it was yeah. the, the best guess of what all these equations turned out to mean. It was just a guess. Yeah. So, like so many things bubble up to become facts that aren't facts. Exactly. Physics does exactly the same things. You know, it's like uh, we talk about the, you know, the particles, an electron, you know, a very important little particle, right? That's how all of our electrical stuff works, <laughs> you know, electrons. But electrons don't really exist. It's as if there were an electron. People don't measure <laughs> electrons. I mean, there's the milk and oil drop experiment where they decided what the charge was on an electron. But they measure events. They measure things that happen. And then they make up a story about the the theory of why it should happen that way. They were measuring forces. And the problem is that as our science got more and more complicated, the mathematics got more and more complicated to describe it. And pretty soon, we were confusing our mathematics with the real world. Yeah. That's the problem. We're looking at our equations and saying, well, all right, now how can we interpret that in the real world? Yeah. And we make this interpretation like Einstein's general relativity. Oh, space is flexible. It's like the rubber sheet and the mass gets there. It's like a big dimple in the sheet and da 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 da. So they make this, but that is just something they make up 
because it seems like the best way to describe what the equations are doing. It doesn't mean that it's, that it's physical. Right. You know, it's not, it's, it doesn't mean that that's actually what's going on. It's just something we make up to tell that story because it seems sort of like this, but then you believe it. And once you believe it, then sure enough, you know, there's this big rubber sheet out there. There's this, <laughs> there's this stretchy space time and it does has all these, these things. And that's just the mathematics. And that's where, that's why scientists come up with this silliness about there is no time because they look at their equations and then they come up, they interpret them to what it, does it mean physically? And whenever you take a bunch of equations and say, what does that mean physically? <laughs> eh, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> math is not physical. Math is the, you know, is the problem. It's the uh, logic, the logic. The quantity. It doesn't mean that at whatever math says that there has to be a physical, exact physical correlation to that. That's not true. Physical is something different. Physical stuff doesn't necessarily occur in all possible logic paths. Every possible logic path of quantity doesn't necessarily turn into something physical. You see? So that's, what is the thing I'm thinking of then? That's what the, the first constant Newton, is it? Newton's, uh, Newton's idea of gravity. That was GMM over R squared. G being a gravitational constant. And then the multiply the two masses divide by the square of the distance between their centers, and that would be the gravitational force between the two masses. That was Newton's idea. And again, the idea was, it looks like masses attract each other. Uh -huh. You see, this mass and that mass, they attract each other. So science said, well, it looks like masses attract. It's this product of the two masses divided by the square of the distance between their centers times this basically is a as a proportionality uh, coefficient, you know, a constant. And you come up with that constant by doing measurements in a lab. You come up with what that constant is. So that was the idea. Masses attract. That was the model. And pretty soon, just like we've been talking, physicists believe that the masses attract each other. Well, why do the masses attract each other? Don't have any idea why masses should attract each other, but they must because the equation works. So that's a thing where you look at the equation, come up with this idea that masses attract, and you know it's a it's not a bad description of what's going on, but you can't take that as a physical fact. Sure. You know, okay, it's a good way to describe what the equation is saying. You know. M1 times M2 over, you know, distance between them squared. It looks like the masses are attracting. But it doesn't have to be that way. That's just the math. Something is making it as if the masses were attracting each other, you see? Mm -hmm. Something. Well, in this case, it's a virtual reality, and it's being computed yeah. as if. Those masses attracted each other. So it's, it's the, you know, you have to not confuse the mathematics with the reality, with it's the physical part reality. Of the computation of the virtual reality. Yeah, it's part of the computation. So if like you have constant. Two, yeah, if you have two masses, then it just computes what the, what the force is going to be between them. It computes that out of an equation. Hmm. Okay. Now we look at it and we want to turn it into something physical. We don't say, well, that's the equation and the virtual reality just computes that. And yeah. that's, the, that's the force it, it renders. Yeah. We don't say that. We say, oh, the masses attract each other. And then Einstein ran into problems with that. He could only push that so far. Once he got into the relativity, that didn't play so well anymore. <laughs> so then he came up with the rubber sheet and there's space time and space time is stretchy. And when you have masses, then the, the space time stretches around them in such a way as that, uh, you know, the gravity particles kind of get caught in that in that vortex as they go by. And then where you have big masses, time goes slower and 
he came up with all these things that would then match with his, his special relativity and came up with a whole different thing. But again, to say, oh, well, then reality is like a rubber sheet. Uh -huh. Space time is like a rubber sheet and it deforms around masses. And the, so people turn that into something physical. And typically they don't in the first decade or two. At that mm -hmm. point, they're still aware that this is just somebody's sense of what's going on. You know, they're turning yeah. it into a physical description so we can talk about it with each other. Yeah. These masses attract each other. Well, it's as if they do. And it's as if space time, you know, had these properties and so on. And they don't realize that that it's that the the physical analog of what's physically being going on there. They don't realize that that's just something that's made up. It's the best it's the best description that the physicist can come up with, but that doesn't make it right because this is a virtual reality. It is a computed reality. There doesn't have to be any physical thing. A representation of it. Yeah, representation mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. All you need are the equations and a computer. And then that's the way it works, <laughs> you see. And digital computing is not the same as what they call analytic equations. Those are equations that are continuous. Okay, you have continuous equations. And that's what we think reality is made of because we have a continuous reality, we think. Mm. So scientists are wrong on both. You know, that we do not have a continuous reality. We have a pixelated reality. But they think it's continuous and therefore you need continuous functions to describe it. You can't have mm -hmm. mathematical equations describing reality if they have holes in them. You know, they have to have continuous functions. So that's called analytical math. And what you can do with analytical math is that you can come close to what actually happens in the world. But it's very, very hard to become exact because the real world is a lot more complicated. You know, like a, a, a trajectory. If you fire a cannon, cannonball goes up and it comes down and it does that basically on a parabola. Okay, it goes up and down. So it's like y equals x square, you know, or x equals y square, depending on where you want your parabola to face. And that's the motion. But then you have air friction. Now it's not a parabola anymore. Now you have inconsistencies in gravitation. You know, gravitation. You did that yeah, in your top down. Yeah, gravitation isn't a a uh, uniform field. There's variations in the gravitation. The Earth is not a sphere, and the Earth doesn't have a homogeneous core. You know, sometimes there's a lot of weight here. You know, big mountains full of granite. Well, that's more dense than this part, which is all water. So you don't have the a uniform density everywhere in a spherical Earth, but you assume all those things. So you get rid of the air friction, you get rid of the, you know, the variations in gravity, you get rid of the fact that the earth isn't round, you get rid of, you get rid of all these other problems. And now what do you have? Oh, the cannon goes on a parabola. So you see, so that's a nice analytical piece of math that approximately tells you what actually happens in the real world. The real world isn't done with analytic equations. The real world is computed out of a computer. And when you have, you know, computational results rather than analytical math results, they can be a lot more complex. So the analytical mathematics is really never much more than an approximation of the real world. And what we think is exactly the opposite. Physicists and mathematicians will tell you that the analytical functions, if we could just figure out what they were, they'd be terribly, terribly complex to take in all the little details. But that would be the real true answer. And you can approximate it with a digital computer. See, they look at it just backwards. They think that continuous math has to fit a continuous reality. And a computer can only get close, can only oh. get to be an estimation because the computer is pixelated. So it can't be continuous. So it can never get more than close to the right answer, when in fact, it's just the opposite. Reality is computed. It's pixelated. It's too. pixelated. Digilate. It's computed. That's why you can have all these 
little annoying things like air friction, you know, and a computer doesn't care because a computer can just compute all those things as it goes. If you tried to do that, take all those things into consideration, your equations would get very unwieldy and very hard to work with and too big and too immense if you took all of that into consideration. So it, they just have it backwards. That's the way it is. It's the digital is the way it really is. That's the real thing. And uh, trying to force analytic equations to describe it is, is painful. It's like trying to put a foot that's too big into a shoe that's too small. It doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't work.